opportunity to go to the highest authority in the land. He could appeal to Caesar. And you all know that story. He's being, he, their um, King Agrippa is talking to him and he says, I appeal to Caesar. And you think, okay, that's great. You get to go to the most important person in the, in the nation to hear your case. And it isn't, wasn't that simple as you remember the story. He, he had to be accompanied by soldiers. They had to bring him to a ship. They had to put him on a ship. The ship went down. The, as it was going down, the guards that were looking after him said, let's kill him in case he escapes. And the commander had to save his life. And then he ended up in the water, and he ended up on the beach, and he got bitten by a poisonous snake, and he spent three months on the Isle of Patmos. And then he ended up finally getting to Rome, and it was two years waiting in his own apartment that he paid for. So even though you did get to talk to the most important person, it didn't happen like that. It was a long process, and a dangerous one at that. Well, in this case of, of the psalmist, God came to him. He's there all the time, just waiting to have an honest conversation with you, even if you're mad at him. He listens. Proverbs, if you read through Proverbs, it talks about poor people. And it, poor people have a hard time having an audience with their brother or with their neighbor, let alone a king. But that's not the case with God. God is not that way at all. He wants to hear from you, and he's, he's okay even if you're honest. You don't have to sugarcoat it with God. Because he knows exactly what's going on in your heart and your life. In some cultures, if someone saves your life, you have an, an, uh, an obligation to serve him the rest of your life. He's rescued your life at the cost or the, the risk of his own, so you serve him. And if in the process of serving him you save your life, his life, then your debt is paid. Off you go. But there's no way you can do that with God. God has no, nothing, he, there's nothing you have that he needs. He has everything. There's nothing you can, he, you can give him that will pay that debt. And then he, but he does say that he wants you to serve him. And when you do serve him, he gives you joy. So, in the, in the end, even though you do serve him, you get the best part of the bargain. How often do we listen to stories about somebody who is at the wit's end, and beyond all hope of rescue, and someone steps in and rescues them? Half of the books, the novels that are written in the, in the library are that kind of thing. Where, and we love a story like that, where somebody's rescued. Um, we've all heard that saying. Becca told me to, it's because it's the story of a child who's asking for something unselfishly and she gets it. We've all heard stories of a, a child that's sick and they, their kind of their dying wish is to meet their, their, their hero, whether it's a sports hero or a movie hero, and, and sometimes that person will actually come to the hospital and, and visit with them. And sometimes it's just a publicity stunt in order to keep their name in the paper. They, you know, they, they came and visited this person, they get the picture taken and all that. But sometimes it's really because they want to help. Um, before COVID came, airlines, Northwest and WestJet, would do some wonderful things for Christmas and they were really nice. And, people would watch the video, and it would be five or, five or six or seven minutes long, and people would watch it over and over again. And it was a great idea. Um, this, I watched, I, I just clicked on WestJet Christmas, and one came up where they set up a box in the airport in one of the, you know, you, you sit in this area if you're going on this flight. And the box had a screen with Santa Claus on it and a camera 
so you could talk live to Santa. Then the children would come up and Santa would say, what do you want? And, and, and he'd tell them he'd want this toy or that toy. And, and the adults would get in on it and they'd say, I want this or that. And everybody thought it was really nice. It was a nice thing to do. It, it used up that time. You were entertained and you got on the flight. And while they were on the flight from Toronto to Alberta or BC, somebody would open shop, they got all those presents, everything they asked for, they wrapped it, and when they landed, they went to the place where the luggage comes down the conveyor, but it wasn't luggage. It was gifts, all wrapped, Christmas gifts with people's names on it. And the little boy would get his gift, and one of the men had thought, this is a great joke, I want socks and underwear. Who wants socks and underwear for Christmas? But that's what he said, and that's what he got. Uh, a couple parents said, I want a big screen TV, and they got a big screen TV. Well, they did it so that the company comes across as going above and beyond what's necessary. They were seen as a wonderful people. And so, they got their money's worth because I watched the video two years later. It was a great advertisement. And so it was a win-win. Win-win for the people that got the presents, win for the company. Well, I want to look at this text because it's a win-win story for the psalmist and a win-win story for God. Number one is easy access, easily accessible. Um, Verse 1 and 2, easily accessible. I love the Lord because He hears my voice and my supplication. Because He has inclined His ear to me, therefore I call upon Him as long as I live. Remember I said about the um, bridging the gap, getting the opportunity to speak to somebody. And, and it says in this verse, I love the Lord because He hears. Anytime. Um, I do online things sometimes. Sometimes you purchase a, a ticket for a convention, or sometimes you, you, anyway, at work, there was this one that I had to fill out all these details so we could be part of this thing. And one of the things I had to do was put in my phone number. And you said, oh, that's easy, right? That's simple. And you put in, I put in my phone number, and go all through these, all these questions, and you get to the bottom, you pu push enter, and it would say five places are not complete. And I went up, and I filled in something else, and and I changed something, and I put in the phone number. Went down to the bottom, wouldn't work. So it was one five zero six dash whatever. So I changed it. One space, 506, space, didn't work again. So I didn't put it in again without the spaces. And then I put it in without the one, but with the dashes. And I put it in without <laughs> the one, but with the... It, it, I did it 15 times. I, I, at the point, I was, if I could throw the computer, I would have. But it shouldn't be that hard. It had no business being that hard. I was, there, NBW is a shipping company that's in no, the runs with the Nova Scotia, and, and you always just called up the dispatcher and said, we have a package, and they said, where, and you come and pick it up. Simple, right? Well, they're going to do it online. So now you have to learn their online system. And you, there's two pages of it, and you have to fill this all in. And if you go over, you got this, and this, and this, and this, and then you go over here and fill in this. And it, Enter and it won't take it because you didn't fill in the weight of the package. And so you go over and fill in the weight of the package and it erases all of this. And so you put it all back in and push enter and you didn't put in the length of the package. So it, it, eventually you say, I'll ship it midland courier and I'll pay the freight rather than try to figure this out. Well, it wasn't that way for the psalmist. If he got it wrong, if he did everything wrong, God still heard and understood. I, thinking of getting it wrong, 
When I typed this up and printed it out, I put in, God, us, not that way. And I read it and I said, what am I trying to say? When I wrote this up, God is not that way. I couldn't understand my own writing. I put another place, be all like the same. It's W. We all like the saying, Becca. You know, the whole problem. I didn't understand what I said, but God got it immediately. He understood exactly what I was saying. Now, WestJet wanted you to watch the ads and become a customer for life. Well, God wants us to know that He hears and understands and wants you to share everything with Him. He wants you to to know that he listens and he has the capacity to hear and understand that even if you get it messed up, even if you can't say the words right, even if you can't express what you, what you mean, some people can't express it. You can't get it out. I can't say what I want to say, but the Lord understands. No matter how many people take him up on the offer, he's not overwhelmed. Number two is pain in the offering. There's a song I love that has that line. So, pain in the offering. In verse three it says, the cords of death encompassed me and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then it called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For he has rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. Well, people like to think that when you become a Christian, it's all going to be easy. Those difficulties you had before are going to all be looked after, smooth sailing. But the older you get, the more you understand that that's not the case. You've got lots of stories that prove that that's not the case. I watched this funny video. Um, Jen Zed is a, somebody that's up to 25 years old. And um, she was called in for an interview to get a job. And so she comes in and the interviewer understands that if, if this person answers the questions well, there would be a job offered to her. But she thinks that because you called, you're not going to waste my time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get the job. And so he asks her, do you understand Excel and all these word programs that you'll need? Well, no, I don't understand those at all, but I have a list of demands that I want fulfilled. And one of the demands is that I don't do mornings, so I'll be in around 10, but sometimes it'll be 11. And, and and, and after a half a dozen of these requests, like uh, not regular coffee, it has to be espresso or whatever, he says, look, you just came in for an interview. I'm not, you're not getting any of these things. And she's bad and she says, if that's the case, I'm going to quit. <laughs> and he says, well, you haven't been hired yet, you can't quit. <laughs> well, the whole point of it, and it's funny to watch, is that Young people who have been sheltered so much, they've never had any difficulties. They've never, and, and when their difficulty comes, they have no idea how to handle it. But as I read this, I don't think that's this person. This is not a sheltered person. This is a person who's dealt with all of the other difficulties that everybody has. And now he's been, the difficulties are beyond what he can handle. I remember as a young boy, I would be five or six or seven. And there was a woman that came to Luke's Mountain Baptist Church. Her name was Mrs., because I don't remember her first name, Mrs. Mills. But when I knew her, it was Mrs. Burlock. And I said, I, I had no idea how she could recover for all of the things. Her first husband had died. Her second husband had died. One of her children had been killed, and one of her boys had committed suicide and she was sick all the time 
And I mean sick, sick, not like I got the cold today. And I, as a little boy, I th thought to myself, how can she stand up under all of this? And I hope that she went to the Lord and, and, and he gave her comfort. And I thought to myself, um, I knew that there was other people, my mother for one, that suffered a lot. But she was the one that I felt, I always felt bad for. And I thought it was, as much as a boy, a, little, a young boy can grieve for somebody ancient, she was probably 50 at the time, <laughs> um, she was the one. And she could have read that verse 3, and, and that would have been true for her. And I didn't know if she could have read verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and that, that would have been true, but I thought, this psalm, if it fit for anybody, if it would work for anybody, if it would give anybody comfort, it would be her. Because she had so many troubles. And sometimes you have troubles that come all at once in a day, like, like Job did. Sometimes the troubles seem to come and last year after year. Well, this psalm can be used for either person. If you have troubles that come in the, and all at once, or you have troubles that last for years, this is one of those songs that will work for you. Well, number three is a little more recovery time needed. Verse 9 to 11 says, I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe what I, when I said, I am greatly afflicted. And I said in my alarm, all men are liars. Sometimes things happen that are very difficult and they happen to people, and, and, and neighbors come, and they help. They bring food, they send cards, they make calls, and all of that is greatly appreciated. But that maybe the man in this psalm and, and anybody else, what happens is you do that. The community does that for a while, but then they move on. They stop calling, and they stop sending meals, and they go on with their life. And that person is alone, and they feel cheated because it stopped. It stopped too soon. All that sympathy and help, and they stopped, but they're still dealing with the pain. And the others have gone on to their happy life. I remember a woman in an African country. I didn't know her personally, but I was watching this, and she said that in, an Af in this African village or tribe she lived in, what happened is when somebody died, everybody came. They were with you 24-7. They made you grieve. They, made you, they wrung every bit of grief out of you so that at the end of a month, you couldn't cry if they rubbed raw onion under your eyes. She, and, and I wondered to myself, was that her experience, or was that the majority of people's experience? That, look, I, I've grieved, and now my grieving is done. But we know that different people grieve differently. And maybe that person in that tribe would say, I need you to come and stay another two or three more weeks. I'm not done grieving. I, when I read this, I believe, I believe that when I said I'm greatly afflicted, and I said in my alarm, all people are liars, I thought to myself, even the most helpful people, the most concerned and caring people, who try their hardest, and you still might be mad at them for failing you, for missing all that suffering, and you say, that is not fair. You see, they, people can't reach into your soul and heal you like Jesus can. They might try, but they're not going to be like Jesus. Number four is coming out the other side. Verse 12 says, The Lord has been... Oops, wrong, wrong um, psalm. What shall I render to the Lord? for all his benefits toward me. 
I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of all the people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. O Lord, shall I, surely I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. You have loosed my vows. To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. O may it be in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of all Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Coming out the other side, I heard a testimony of a woman who had been healthy and then she discovered she had cancer. And she was upset with the Lord about this cancer, as were her family, but she ended up in the hospital in a double room with another person who had the same cancer. And as a Christian, she knew that God would look after her, but the other person wasn't a Christian. And what happened was that other person was confined to the room. She had to watch this person deal with it truthfully of how, how her family and her dealt with, with the same diagnosis she had. And she got to watch how, how they brought it to the Lord. They prayed. They um, See, a lot of people think that there's a Sunday morning Christian who if everything is perfect. You may be yelling at your children in the car, and you may, may be having a fight, but you come in and everybody's smiling, and everybody's had a, the, their face washed and their hair combed, and they're perfect. Well, this woman got to see this woman through her suffering and all of those things, and she became a Christian. What happened was, she watched all of this and understood that God is there and real. Well, this man, the, the writer of this song, is coming up the other side of the pain, and he knew he was coming. He knew it was over. He knew it was... It, and he knew that God had been with him every step of the way. I remember uh, C.S. Lewis, the guy that wrote Narnia, the guy that wrote um, a lot of books. And he wrote this... He, he had married late in life, and his wife had died. And he, he ended up writing a book called A Grief Observed. It was his journey through the grief. At one end, as he went into it, he was mad at God for taking her. He only spent a few years with her, and then all the way through until he came out the other side. Well, see, remember I said about how lots of people can't express their feelings. They couldn't get it out. I remember I lived next door to a, a man, Norman Lutz, and he was a man of few words. He hardly said anything. And, but God chose C.S. Lewis to go through this pain because he could express those things. He'd written a book a few years earlier called uh, uh, The Problem of Pain. And, some, and, and it was all theologically correct and it was a, a masterful work. But now he went through the pain himself. He understood what it would felt like. And so this grief observed was God's way of giving us this gift of this book. And it couldn't have been anybody else. It had to be him. He had to go through it. And that book is still being published and printed over and over again 60 years later. Now, this is one of those things that it was him able to answer these deep theological questions and people recognized that as they read it in their pain that he knew what he was talking about. He understood that. Well, he understood it, but he didn't understand it as well as Jesus did. Jesus came as a small child. Jesus came to experience life from 
being the child and being every experience we have, it says in Hebrews 4, 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Well, when we read this verse, we're, we think, well, Jesus was tempted to lie, he was tempted to steal, all those things, but it's more than that. He went through every possible thing we could. He lost his father. He lost friends. He had the opportunity to save people, and he knew that he couldn't because there was a reason for this person to die, and he had to, we went through that. He was accused of being a devil. He, 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 he heals by the devil. Every good thing he did was condemned as evil. He recognized and he was tempted in every way we are. He was accused wrongly, everything. Well, the nice part about this psalmist coming out the other end of suffering, and he knew that he was rescued by the hand of God, and he was willing to have everybody hear it. He was asking for the chance to do it in the presence of all the people in the courtyard of the temple. He wanted to praise in a place where people would recognize that this is what we do. And the reason you do that is because it spurs others on to follow your example. They, they have had trouble and hearing your trouble and you're coming out the other end. Well, what's the application? Well, I use that word application because these, this is what Bible passages that, that these are made for. They're tools and they're proper tools, universal tools. I, I don't know if you noticed that I've got some tools up here. This is a, made by Gray. It's a 7 16th BSW and a 1 half inch BSF. Well, you can tell by that that it's at least 3 quarters of an inch. So what's 7 16th BSF? BSW. Well, it's probably made for working on an English car. i got some more here. This, this one is a... 13 30 seconds wrench. You can't even buy a nut that's 13 30 seconds in Canada. This one is um, 19 30 seconds. This one is 25 30 seconds. This one is just says Ford and it has no sign of what it is. This one is 3 8 BSF, you know that's three quarters, right? It's not three eighths, and this one says five sixteenths. Well, I bought those wrenches not because I needed them, but they were in a box of other things I bought for ten dollars. And they're not universal tools. You can't you you can't buy a nut that they don't fit in Canada. You might only be able to buy it in the in UK, and now they use the metric, so it may need, so they're no good. Well, this song is not like one of those wrenches. They help in a society where we we have first world problems. Your air conditioner is not blowing cold air, and you can't roll the windows down because it's raining. That's a first world problem. I listen to a woman from North um, North Korea. She has third world problems. They ate dragonflies because it was the dragonflies kept them from just being hungry. They they allowed them to just be hungry and not die of starvation. They ate dragonflies. That's a third world problem. But this psalm works on both of them. The psalm is a story. And it could be anybody's story. It starts with an impossibly painful situation, and it could be physical, and it could be mental. And the person calls on God, and it passes from impossible, and starts how 
explaining how God can save them. This person is honest and says that sometimes every person can be against you, but not God. I was listening to CBC, and most of the time it's just, I just turned it off, but they, they were talking about this woman, a Canadian woman, wrote, did a movie called Natural Hair. And she did this movie because um, certain black women have hair that is so curly that even if you wash it and care for it, it'll go into dreadlocks. That's what it'll be. It'll be a knot. You could never put a comb through it. And some of these black women are told by their boss that if you don't fix your hair, you're going to be fired. Children, girls in school are, are, are teased and tormented. They have people stick a pencil in it because it, it won't fall out. It's there. It's, you, you're going to have to pull it out. And, and it's all because we have fashion that says this is the way it should look. It should be straight or it should have little waves and it can't be all curly. And that's not right. And she's right about that. Well, everyone, including other black people, look down on these women that have hair that way. I, I see lots of women, black women, that have their hair cut so short because that's their way of dealing with it. Well, I say even other black people look down on on these people, but not God. He understands. He understands whether you're, dry, you're drowning from some unjust thing that's happening to you or something evil is happening to you. He understands. And the nice thing about this song is it works. It's a universal tool. It works if the, it's sickness or it's evil or it works even on a hair problem. things it also does is it tells you to be grateful after God has fixed the problem. The psalmist is happy to say right out loud that he's here to say the words, these words because God saves and restores. So I suggest that you take this tool and you put it on your tool wall and you put it somewhere where you can use it and it's displayed so you can use it and it doesn't get all covered with dust. Here's what these, I say the, this tool will do. It will remind you that bad stuff happens. It isn't if, it's when. And how bad will it be and did it catch you off guard? The first thing this says is bad stuff happens. Number two is God can rescue you if you call on him. That's who he is. That's what he does. It makes him happy to be called on in faith, believing that he's someone who hears and answers. Number three is that you need to acknowledge this to yourself, that it wasn't you that saved you. It wasn't circumstances. It was God. And give him the praise. And number four is find someone, someplace, to do it publicly. You'll be surprised at how many people are thirsting to hear the story of praise so that they know they're not alone in their troubles and that God really does step in and help those who seek it. Well, this is a tool that everyone needs. You tell them where to get it. Tell them it's right here. And tell them they can purchase it without money and it has eternal benefits. It's not like a video by WestJet, but it, it, it's much better. It's eternal. Let's pray. Lord.